President and venal houseplant Joe Biden held a Zoom meeting with Chinese communist tyrant Xi Jinping this week. The autocrat Xi called the three and a half hour meeting, quote, another productive step in our ongoing efforts to lull America into passivity until we crush it beneath our iron heel, unquote. Houseplant Biden said it was, quote, entertaining in parts, but not as good as Paris and Love. That's a great show. When does that come on? Unquote. Genocidal dictator Xi greeted President Houseplant as, quote, an old friend. And the venal Biden responded by asking the Chinese oppressor, quote, how do you pronounce your first name? X-I. Is that 11? What the hell kind of name is 11? Damn, you Chinese cats are hard to understand. You sound like the guy in my old laundry. He always wanted to bless my suit. I used to say, bless my suit? What are you, the trouser priest? Why can't you just press it like an ordinary dry cleaner? Oh, wait, they're telling me your name is pronounced Xi. Is that a name or a pronoun? You're not one of those girly boys, are you? Man, in my day, you called yourself Xi, and Corn Pop would take you out behind the barn. I always wondered what went on back there. I think Corn Pop was a little light in the loafers himself, if you know what I mean. Unquote. Despot Xi used the meeting with the American House plan to ask several questions he feels are central to his national program, such as, what will you and Jill be doing next Thursday evening while I'm conquering Taiwan? Have you read my script to the new James Bond movie where Bond helps Britain become a Chinese colony? And I've heard American women are hot but mouthy. Do you think they'll mind being enslaved by our mighty warriors while we train your young men to wear dresses on TikTok? President Houseplant also asked several questions, including, where am I? Who is that on TV and why is his face yellow? Does he have jaundice or something? And where am I? Communication difficulties hampered agreement on some important issues. For instance, the totalitarian Xi agreed to take measures to prevent climate change as long as he didn't have to do anything about the climate. <laughs> and of course, it was difficult to reach understanding on human rights, which is pronounced in Chinese as a longish period of braying hyena-like laughter. The meeting ended on a cordial note, with Biden giving Xi a dishonest rhododendron to remember him by, and Xi responding to the gesture by presenting Biden with a virus that will kill upward of 5 million people. Xi then invited Biden out to a bar where they could, quote, Taiwan on. Get it? Taiwan on? Which was followed by more brain, hyena-like laughter. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky-dunky. Life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky dee doo Ship-shaped, dipsy-topsy, the world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray, it makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray, oh, hooray, hurrah. All right, the vast right-wing conspiracy known as Clavenon continues as we speak. The jury has just uh, come back in the Rittenhouse uh, trial with uh, not guilty on all counts. Um, I think that's good news. That's justice being done. And uh, I think it took them a long time because they couldn't decide whether to declare him uh, not guilty or mayor of Kenosha. Uh, we'll be talking about that. And we're going to talk about uh, the incredible corruption of our elites and our leaders. I got a story no one else is talking to, uh, talking about that I think you'll be really interested in, just kind of highlights, underscores some of that corruption. Mark Hemingway will join us to talk about his and Molly Hemingway's new book, Rigged, about the 2020 election. Plus, I'll be saying some stuff about femininity that will make your head explode. So please keep a mop handy. Go on Apple Podcasts and subscribe. Why not? Why not? Go on Apple Podcasts and subscribe and leave us a five-star review if you... Um, if you do that, we'll be grateful, but you won't get anything for it. Go on YouTube and subscribe to my channel. I don't know. Do we, did we get a comment today? Maybe uh, we, we had to shift studios uh, because of the trial. Oh, we do. I'm sorry. You know, if you leave a comment on uh, my YouTube channel and it is sufficiently racist, uh, sexist, some way, hateful in some way, just so it'll fit in with the rest of the uh, content, um, we will read it on the air. Today is from McTerror. Uh, McTerror one. I think that's already pretty good. Uh, Duchess Camilla, how dare you break wind before me? Biden, oh, I'm sorry. Did you <laughs> go first? <laughs> that's disgusting, McTerror one. Before we get started, you know how much I love my Helix mattress because I'm awake all night, so it's good to have a really, really comfortable mattress. But now the holiday season is coming and there are going to be guests. You need to make sure you have a good sofa. 
Helix has left the bedroom and started making sofas. They just launched a new company called All Form. One word, All Form. They're making terrific, terrific sofas. What makes them so great? For starters, it's the easiest way you can customize a sofa using premium materials and at a fraction of the cost of traditional stores. You can pick your fabric, the sofa color, the color of the legs, sofa size, and shape to make sure it's perfect for you and your home. All form takes just three to seven days to arrive in the mail, and you can assemble it yourself in a few minutes without tools. And if you don't love it, they'll pick it up for free and give you a full refund to find your perfect sofa, check out allform.com slash Clavin. And Allform is offering 20% off all orders for our listeners. So go to allform.com slash Clavin. And while you're relaxing on that sofa, you'll think, I'm so glad I know how to spell Clavin. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. There are no E's in Clavin. All right. And also, one more time, I, I have to really thank you so much for buying When Christmas Comes. You, uh, My new Christmas Yuletide mystery, they call it on the cover. The publisher added that. Um, you know, I am, I'm desperate to turn this into a series featuring the detective Cameron Winter. You have really helped me uh, do that. If you keep buying it, I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. The publisher did not believe Uh, You guys were going to show up. They were stunned by the reaction. Uh, It is getting great reviews. It's being highlighted in the Wall Street Journal uh, this weekend. Louis Aguilar in the American Spectator said, When Christmas Comes is both a great mystery and fine literature. Uh, So please uh, go on and order it. I think you'll love it. The reviews have been fantastic. People are also telling me how much they love it. Uh, So please go on. And the more copies we sell, the more... Uh, Cameron Winter Mysteries, there will be. So thank you again. You know, speaking of this, the other day I was recording uh, Christian Toto's podcast. Christian was on our show and he had me on his uh, podcast right on Hollywood. They're going to play this uh, after Thanksgiving. And he was asking me about the book and he asked me how I came to be a mystery writer. And it really occurred to me that the answer kind of reflects back on some of the things we've been talking about on the show, Uh, especially last week we were talking about the fact that before we can really reform the government or while we reform the government or while we ask America to come back, we have to come back. We have to make something of ourselves. It's not that we have to wait until we're perfect before we take political action. That's ridiculous. But we do have to be living into the life we want to live into so that we ourselves become a good argument for freedom. That is really the point. And And so when he asked me why I became a mystery writer, I was telling him, and some of this is in my memoir, The Great Good Thing, I was telling him that, you know, when I was young, I didn't really have role models that I, I felt I could look up to, especially, you know, you wanted male role models. And I turned to tough guy literature, Ernest Hemingway, Dashiell Hammett, uh, the, the great tough guy mystery writers, movies, um, Humphrey Bogart and Casablanca and all this. But all of these tough guys, there was always something that would bother me about each one. I mean, Casablanca, for instance, I think is still uh, with The Godfather is probably still my favorite movie. And yet it always used to bother me that Humphrey Bogart in that movie refuses to fight World War II because his girlfriend left him. I just thought, dude, it's World War II, you know, like get over it, get over your girlfriend. And then, so there was always something in these tough guys that wasn't quite the role model I was looking for. And then I discovered Raymond Chandler and Raymond Chandler had this detective named Philip Marlowe, uh, who went through the corruption of LA, but always remained nightly. He was kind of modeled on the Arthurian Knights, And he would make these cynical comments about the fact that he was a knight in this terrible, corrupt uh, situation. And Chandler wrote an essay about him uh, called The Simple Art of Murder. This is where we get the phrase mean streets comes from this essay from a famous paragraph that really moved me very deeply when I was a kid, when I was a young man trying to figure out what kind of man I wanted to be. And Chandler said of his hero, he said, down these mean streets, a man must go who is not himself mean, who is neither tarnished nor afraid. The detective in this kind of story must be such a man. He must be, to use a rather weathered phrase, a man of honor, by instinct, by inevitability, without thought of it, and certainly without saying it, the story is this man's adventure in search of a hidden truth. And I remember to this day reading that and reading the Philip Marlowe mysteries and thinking, yes, that that's the kind of man I want to be. That became my ambition to be a man of honor in a corrupt, in what I already knew was a corrupt world. And I obviously don't have to tell you that I failed miserably in that ambition, but it was a noble ambition. And when you have a noble ambition, uh, even when you fail in it, it it teaches you important things. And one of the things it taught me, one of the things it taught me was how 
about my own sin, sinfulness, because as C.S. Lewis says, no one knows how bad they are until they've really tried to be good. So in trying to be a man of honor, you learn about all, all, all of your corruption, which is natural uh, to your heart and uh, part, just part of every human being, the, the bent timber of humanity. Uh, but it also taught me this, that you know, I'm, I'm a, I love puzzles and games, and I always like unfolding the truth and finding the truth. And the fact that the detective is in a search for truth in these stories, and the fact that he's a man of honor are connected. This is what it taught me. It taught me that to have honor, you have to try to find the truth. And the world makes sense. The world is a kind of mystery. It, it can be put together. When you see something that doesn't make sense, when you say something that doesn't make sense, you can be sure you're missing something. And if you continue to double down on not making sense, you will become corrupt. You will lose your honor. And it can just start with a little mistake and a lot of pride, the pride that doesn't want to say, uh, I, I did something wrong. We had a lady who wrote in a while back because she had had an abortion and she didn't know how to deal with it. And, and one of the things, you know, I, I thought it was so important that she accept God's forgiveness because your two choices when you do something wrong are to experience the shame and then accept God's forgiveness and move on, or you have to keep doubling down on the mistakes you're making and then you become corrupt. You become evil because you have to keep saying, no, it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do. And therefore everything starts to become distorted, right? So you have to keep, you have to make sense. The world makes sense. Scientists will tell you the world makes sense. When it doesn't make sense, it's because they don't know enough. They have to find out more and then it will make sense. And the same thing is true with morality and the same thing is true with moral truth. But the thing about moral truth is that it makes sense in a very specific way. You can have a theory, a beautiful, beautiful theory that makes sense. Freudianism was a theory like that. Marxism is a theory like that. And they're so appealing. Those systems are so appealing because they make sense of everything. Everything falls into place until you test them in reality. And this is why Marxists tend to be in places where there is no reality. Universities, Hollywood, the news media, where reality will not be tested. Uh, because the minute you put it in as an economic system, it collapses. You begin with a Marxist premise, right, that all value comes from labor and there's some benign state that's going to redistribute wealth and take over the means of production. And that all, and then everything falls into place. And you think, wow, that's so beautiful, such a beautiful theory, until you find out, no, all value doesn't come from labor. Some value comes from ideas. Some value comes from the discipline of a good culture. Some value comes from the human desire to succeed and compete and beat out the the other guy, which is may be unpleasant, but there's some of the uh, where some of the value comes from, and and the willingness of capital to take risks, the willingness of a person to say, "I'm going to bet my future on this enterprise, even if it fails, and then I'm going to have to take the hit for that." Uh, and, and the fact that there's no benign state, uh, you know, that it's, there's just powerful people trying to hold on to power. So every time you try socialism, it has faltered against this. What is that? It falters against human nature and the reality that destroys almost all logic systems, Freudianism too, is human nature, right? Human nature uh, has to be f factored in to your ideas. That's why capitalism works so well. It's people uh, competing. It's people being greedy. It's people doing things, uh, wanting more for themselves. Democracy the same way. It's people arguing and fighting and having to compromise and being forced to compromise and not just use their power to impose ideas. And that's why you figure in, you factor in human nature. But the interesting thing about human nature is it can be understood, but it can't be understood by pure reason. The older I get, the lesser I understand human nature. Young people are always explaining human nature to me. I look at what's going on in the world. I think, like, how can a teacher, how can a teacher go out and teach children that, that they should judge each other by the color of their skin, which is what's happening with critical race theory, CRT? How can a teacher encourage people uh, to distort their sexuality or to embrace a sexuality that may be uh, perverse and may not be natural to them. And there's uh, all this stuff coming out now about in California, the California Teachers Association plotting to do end runs around uh, parents so they can teach kids to be gay or teach kids or draw kids into the gay world and the gay uh, universe and, the gay, and gay ideas. And, you know, you think, how can somebody be that wicked? Well, young people understand that. Once you get to a certain age, you stop understanding. You think, no, just something is really terribly bent. Something is terribly wrong with human nature. Something is terribly evil in the spiritual world. And after that, you're sort of baffled. But 
in order to understand people, so you can't just use reason to understand people. You have to use something else. You have to suffer with them. That is how you understand people. That's what the word compassion, compassion means. You hear, you've heard about the passion of Christ. Passion comes from a word meaning to suffer. And when you have compassion, you suffer with people. And in order to suffer with people, you have to love them. You have to really love them, even as they are, even loving your enemies, even loving, um, you know, the, the guy next to you who's annoying, uh, who, the guy on the street who's so disgusting. He's been sleeping in his own garbage for uh, weeks and he st- smells bad. And you have to try and teach yourself to love them so that you understand them, so that you see them as they really are. And this is, as I've said before, why Jesus teaches you to love not just your neighbor, but your enemy, because it's the only way you know them and begin to make sense. And when you make sense of the world, when you make sense of the world, you begin to move toward honor. Uh, You know, I, I, I make no claims to having achieved the ambition of being a man of honor in a corrupt world, but I know that I set myself at least against the corrupt world, you know, as much as I can and as with as much willpower as I have and with as much determination and honesty as I have, and that all of that, all of that is involved in in making the world make sense, which is involved in loving people so that you can see them as they are. And what I want to talk about today a little bit is about how that applies when you're reading the news and and how it has turned many people in this country to a level of corruption that really passes the understanding of reason. We're going to be talking about the Rittenhouse verdict in just a second. But first, as the holidays approach, there are still a lot of jobs to fill. You don't want to fill them like we fill them here or else it's going to be chaos like it is here. You got you need holiday lighting installers, advanced snowmakers or mall Santas. If you need to hire for one of these festive roles or any role, really, there's only one place you should go. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Clavin. After all, if ZipRecruiter can fill an advanced snowmaker role, they can most likely help with your hiring needs. ZipRecruiter uses powerful technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job. And it proactively presents these candidates to you. You can easily review these recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply for your job, which encourages them to apply faster. ZipRecruiter's technology is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Don't let your workplace look like the Andrew Clavin show. You can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Clavin. Discover hiring joy with ZipRecruiter. Just jingle your way to ZipRecruiter.com slash Clavin. But first, you need to know how to spell Clavin. It's K-L-A. V A N. So let's talk about the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict. The trial is finally over. The jury came back. Well, let's we'll take a look at the clip as the jury comes back. A very very dramatic scene as this teenage guy uh, hears his fate read to him. You know, a trial. I've covered many trials, and the. This amazing, strange thing about a trial is it's just like theater. It is a ritual. Uh, it has a kind of sense of unreality about it. And then suddenly it becomes very real indeed uh, as a teenage boy sees his life being decided uh, by a jury of his peers. And here's the moment when Kyle Rittenhouse heard the news. State of Wisconsin versus Kyle Rittenhouse. As the first count of the information, Joseph Rosenbaum, we the jury find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the second count of the information, Richard McGinnis, we the jury find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the third count of the information, unknown male, we the jury find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the fourth count of the information, Anthony Huber, we the jury find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the fifth count of the information, Gage Grosskreutz, we the jury find the defendant, Kyle H. H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. Members of the jury, are these your unanimous verdicts? Is there anyone who does not agree with the verdicts as read? Uh, Would you wish the jury pulled? No. Okay. Very uh, touching moment as the kid collapses uh, with emotion. Uh, Who could blame him? Uh, And... You know, this hinged on a very, very um, complex piece of law, which is that when a child rapist attacks you, you're allowed to fight back. I mean, it was so plainly, it seemed to me, uh, self-defense. And I'm very, very slow to question jurors, uh, even when they come back 
with verdicts that I didn't like in the Derek Chauvin uh, case with the George Floyd. I did not think Derek Chauvin, I, I thought Derek Chauvin was up. Uh, committed an act of bad policing, but I don't think that was a murder. Uh, but I rarely question jurors because I know if I wasn't there, I wasn't seeing the full trial. I was just, even, even if you watch every minute on TV, it's not the same thing. But this seems to me very much uh, justice. And more than that, which I take particular pleasure in, I mean, I'm glad for the lad himself, but I take particular pleasure that this is a brutal slap in the face of the media. The media and, and, and if it's greeted by riots, and I'm not saying that's going to happen, you know, but if it's greeted by riots, I think the Democrats will pay a political price, an unbelievable political price, because I think this narrative that the de Democrats sold and the press sold, but I repeat myself, the media sold, was so corrupt, was so dishonest that anyone could see it. You know, they, it, they act as if they're shrouded in mystery. They act as if some cloud of unknowing covers them, covers their corruption. It is amazing what corruption does to the human mind. And we're talking about the fact that when you stop making sense, you know something's wrong. And when you stop making moral sense, you know something's wrong. And if you stick to it, you lose your honor. Now, the, the thing about this was that all the talk about white supremacy, it's interesting because there's this trial going on in Georgia for this Arbery uh, trial, <laughs> where I think that's a lot more doubtful. I've never, uh, I've never been uh, uh, happy with that case. I've always thought that maybe those guys really, really did a bad thing. They, you know, you could have made that case, but here... I mean, how do you call it white supremacy when a kid shoots three white people attacking him, kills two, uh, wounds one, but they're all attacking him and they're all white, but it doesn't matter anymore. Think about this for a minute. Larry Elder runs for governor in California and the LA Times, the biggest paper in the state, calls him the black face of white supremacy. When... Ra Ralph Youngkin won in Virginia and his lieutenant governor, Winsome Sears, a black woman, a uh, former Marine. Uh, th that website 538 ran this a kind of babbling insanity uh, saying, well, you know, sometimes white supremacists vote for black people. They, they defeated Terry McAuliffe, who's like the oldest, whitest man in America. I mean, the guy is just an aging snowball with legs, you know, so, so what it, they're not talking sense anymore. And that that really happens to you if you don't try to make sense, if you don't search for the hidden truths of life, if you don't act like Philip Marlowe in your philosophy, seeking out those truths and trying to behave with honor, you become this twisted, ugly thing. And this is a genuine slap in the face. Uh, the judge had to ban MSNBC because they were following jurors around. An absolutely despicable thing to do. You know, Matt Walsh, Matt Walsh was on uh, Twitter saying that the press in this country should be put in prison. And people were saying, how could he say that? And I thought, no, I don't want the government to have the power to put reporters in prison. But do they belong in prison? The hell yes, they do. I mean, this is absolutely despicable. The word racism, which is a real thing, you know, racism is a real thing. People really suffer from it. Uh, if, if you banned the word racism, you remember those old Charlie Brown, <laughs> Brown com cartoons that were on TV? If you banned the word racism, the left would sound like the adults in Charlie Brown. It sounded like this. <laughs> Because they have no, you know, they have no arguments. So it just be because they don't have anything to say, and the word is now meaningless because they use it to mean stuff we don't like or stuff people who disagree with us, and it has become rote. You know, uh, this is you know this is part of the reactivity of politics, which I don't like, and I don't like to see it on the right. I don't like it when the right get, you know, people got mad at me because I said, I don't believe Kyle Rittenhouse is a hero. I don't believe a 70 year old who goes into a violent situation with a rifle, uh, untrained. He's not a military person or anything like that. I don't believe that's a hero. I believe that that was an unwise thing to do, but it's unwise to walk down a dark alley at night. If someone mugs you, it's the mugger's fault, right? Even though you have been unwise, but I, I feel like we react, we react to things. And what we are reacting to is this unbelievable, mind-stopping corruption. You know, how did this thing start? I mean, I want to go back to this. How did this thing start? It started with a, 
a criminal being shot by the police while he was threatening a cop with a knife. So the cop was the hero. The, and, and, they, and how did the violence come about? Let's listen to what Democrats have been saying in this country for years, really, since Trump was elected. This is cut 10. I, I, I just don't even know why there aren't uprisings all over the country. and Maybe there will be. People need to start taking to the streets. This is a dictator. You know, there needs to be unrest in the streets for as long as there is unrest in our lives. Enemies of the state. Show me where it says that protests are supposed to be polite and peaceful. Do something about your dad's immigration practices, you feckless. When they go low, we kick. How do you resist the temptation to run up and wring her neck? Biggest terror threat in this country is white men, most of them radicalized right up to the right. I thought he should have punched him in the face. I said, even if you lost, he insulted your wife. Yes. He came down the escalator and called Mexicans rapists and murders. He said, well, what do you think I should have done? I said, I think you should have punched him in the face and then gotten out of the race. And, you would have uh, been a hero. I'd like to punch him in the face. I said, if we were in high school, I'd take him behind the gym and beat the hell out of him. Punch some people in the face. When was the last time an actor assassinated a president? They're still going to have to go out and put a bullet in Donald Trump. And that's a fact. <laughs> Jeez, Louise. And they wonder why the cities burn and then the cities burn. They say it's mostly peaceful. Like it's mostly peaceful like the Democrat Party. You know, what does it look like in this situation not to react? What does it look like to love your neighbor? What does it look like to love your enemy? Well, for one thing, you know, it's so simple in some ways. You know, we understand there's a lot of black crime in this country. It's a small number of criminals committing the worst crime in this country. Uh, and a lot of them are black, a, a, a propon, you know, a, too many of them uh, for the percentage of black people in the country. So you understand that a cop, white, black, whatever he is, is going to look askance at black people. That's that's human nature. It's just going to happen. But we also understand the majority of black people are not committing, are not criminals and but they're not innocent either because none of us is innocent, right? We've all, you, I'm sure you've had a cop come up the front walk and you thought, oh, what did I do wrong? You know, did he see me when I ran that red light? You know, I, we've all had this moment when a cop goes by and thinks, oh, I hope he didn't see me do whatever I wasn't supposed to be doing. So how would it be if cops were looking at you more intensely than they are looking at other people because your skin is the same color as people who are actually criminals. It's uncomfortable. We can understand where that anger comes from that then takes a very, very, very rare incident like the George Floyd killing, which, again, I don't think was murder, but I do think was reckless policing. We can understand how that then sets off this anger that you have but constantly being watched by the police. But, of course, the ironic thing about that is the police feel the same way. A guy who is a reckless cop, a guy who kills somebody even in the in the midst of his uh, resisting arrest is a very, very rare incident among policing. How would you feel then if people started saying, well, we should defund the police while well, the cops are out there killing people? Oh, my. They're littering America. The, the Democrats are doing the same thing to the police that they claim the police are doing to black people. If you stop uh, acting reactive, reactively and you start saying, well, wait a minute, let's try and understand the situation. You have a very, very different situation. Instead, we get Joy Reid. I mean, uh, Joy Reid, this is amazing. Play this clip of Joy Reid talking about this. Cut eight. Brett Kavanaugh, who had been accused by a high school friend of committing sexual abuse of her, cried his way through the hearings to make him a permanent member and associate justice of the United States Supreme Court. And his tears turned out to be more powerful than the tears of Christine Blasey Ford, which were the tears of an alleged victim. But in America, there's a thing about both white vigilantism and white tears, particularly male white tears. Really white tears in general, because that's what Karen's are, right? They Karen out and then as soon as they get caught, it's like, <laughs> green waterworks. White men can get away with that, too. And it has the same effect, even as the right tries to politicize the idea that masculinity is being robbed from American men by multiculturalism and wokeism. They still want to be able to have their tears. Has anybody looked in this woman's eyes? I mean, she's certifiable. She's certified. And she's got that fascist smile she always has, the smile, smile, that little girl smile that all these female fascists have. It's just, it's just an amazing, amazing thing that nobody... But that is the kind of... It's almost a state of madness. It almost is a state of madness. That level of corruption is almost a state of madness. You know, there's a story I want to talk about that nobody's talking about. And I hesitate to bring it up because I don't want to start a conspiracy theory. And that's not... I'm not being conspiratorial about it, but it does t say something. There's a woman who's gone missing in L.A. She's been missing weeks. A woman named Heidi Plum. 
39. Uh, she's a mother. She uh, was watching the, her son's football game or she wandered off and they found her dog and nobody knows where she is. And it doesn't sound very good. Now, she works uh, as a controller and executive assistant for an investment advisory company called Camden Capital Partners, LLC. And it's very mysterious and they don't know what happened to her. It doesn't sound good, right? But the SEC in 2019 charged the company that she works with, uh, Camden Capital, and charged the executive, Jason Sugarman, and his business partner, partner Jason Galanis, with securities fraud, right? The pair had developed a scheme to steal $43 million from its clients that they purported to invest in Native American tribal ma- bonds. And I'm looking at those names. Do you remember those names, right? Those are names that Hunter, those are people Hunter Biden associated with. He had that thing with the Russian billionaire and he was laundering, uh, he was charged allegedly laundering money. Uh, and John Galanis, who has a history of white collar fraud convictions, uh, alleged that his son, Jason, who was the guy we're talking about, worked with Biden and their partner, Devin Archer, uh, to help her launder money, right? And these are all the same people who are involved in this story of this missing woman that nobody's paying any attention to, uh, who's obviously, you know, somehow this corruption has I, I made her run or made her somebody attack her. We don't know what it is yet. Uh, and it, And it's all these same people that Hunter Biden was associating with. In ver- in, and the press covered it up, right? These are all the people. Remember, he was associating with these people. and He was going to get 10% for the big guy. That was the China deal he had going on. Now, look, I'm not saying that Hunter is involved in the, the disappearance of this woman. And I'm certainly not saying that Joe Biden had this woman killed to protect Hunter. But that's obvious. No, <laughs> that's, I'm joking there. It's not, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is what an ugly bunch of people for our president and his family to be uh, you know, immersed with. How, how corrupt are these people? These are, you know, how corrupt are these people that they were hanging out with Jeffrey Epstein, that they were flying on the Lolita Express? How filthy are they? You know, and, I, and I, by the way, I'm not uh, exempting Republicans, but I, it is it does seem thick and fast on the ground with these with Democrats. And it's the Democrats who are always yelling at us about, oh, Donald Trump, you voted for Donald Trump. And I keep saying he ran against a career criminal, you know, and these people are so immersed in this dirty world and the press in defending them becomes part of them. The press has become so corrupt. You know, Gerard Baker, a columnist I really like at the Wall Street Journal, he wrote this column about the mainstream media things they've said. Here are some things they've said. Kyle Rittenhouse is a domestic terrorist. Brett Kavanaugh is a rapist. Donald Trump won in 2016 only because he colluded with the Kremlin. Nick Sandman, the boy from Covington Catholic High School on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, was an entitled white bigot. Mr. Trump said the neo-Nazis at Charlottesville were good people. These are all lies. Last year's riots were mostly peaceful. Unarmed black men are routinely shot in huge numbers by police officers. The discovery of Hunter Biden's laptop was a Russian plot. And he says the worst thing about it is not the lies is that they want to stop everybody else from speaking in the name of misinformation. They want to protect their lies by silencing everybody else. That is part of the corruption that you see. And I mean, now we see uh, John Durham. It doesn't look to me like John Durham is going to come up with some big conspiracy where he shows the FBI was out to get Donald Trump. But he is showing that this Steele dossier that the press ran with for three years that accused Donald Trump of all kinds of things, is you know, he he's indicted the guy who's supposed to be the main source, who was in fact a Russian guy, maybe Russian intelligence. So it was Hillary. It was Hillary who was uh, colluding with the Russians, not Trump all this time. The corruption is so deep. It is so deep and it has to be, it has got to be because the philosophy doesn't make sense. And that's why I don't like it when we on the right react when we react to them. I don't care about them. I see what's happened to them. I see where they've gone. I know who leads them. I know what road they're on. I know where that dark road goes, right? I don't want us to just say, well, they say black, so we say white. They say up, so we say down. That's not what I want. What I want for is for us to decide where we have to go as conservatives and what the future of conservatism should be. All right, we're going to start talking about the future of conservatism. Very important in just a second. But first, it's the holiday season. So deck the halls, walls, windows, and doors with the best deals of the year on the award winning Ring Alarm. I've been telling you about the Ring Video Doorbell. You must know all about it by now, but did you know that Ring makes an award-winning alarm? Ring Alarm is a powerful, affordable home security system that you can easily install yourself. Whether you're running across town or across the country this busy season, you and your loved ones can rest easy knowing that your home is protected. And it's more than just security. Ring Alarm protects your home from flood, freeze, and fire too. That is good news. Plus, it's so much cheaper than those other companies. For what they charge for one month, 
we can get an entire year of Ring Alarm with professional monitoring right now for the best deals of the year on Ring Alarm. Go to ring.com forward slash Clavin. This holiday season, deck the halls, walls, doors, and windows with the best deals of the year on the award-winning Ring Alarm. Go to ring.com forward slash Clavin to get a great deal on a Ring Alarm security kit today. Ring.com forward slash Clavin. Anyone comes to your home, look at them on the doorbell, say, how do you spell Clavin? If they get it right, set off the Ring Alarm. So talking about where the conservative movement is going, there was a speech recently by a lady named Rachel Bovard, a young woman uh, who works uh, at the Heritage Foundation. She writes for the Federalist. Very smart. I've always thought she was a very smart lady. I've kind of paid attention to her. But this was a speech that really went beyond that. Um, and th- this this was a conference on national conservatism, which is kind of an idea that's grown out of Trumpism, uh, the idea that we need to sort of to form a kind of national coalition of conservatives with an idea of what to do about the country. And she made a speech about where we should go in the future. And what got the thing that's so brilliant about it, you won't hear it, this is something no one else will ever say, is it's a girl speech. It's not a boy speech. And that is really what made the difference. Because, you know, on the on the right, guys are now having this conversation uh, has um, was America wrongly founded? You know the Patrick Deneen thing. Has liberalism failed? Do we need the, the uh, Vermeule Catholic integralism? Do we need to just allow Catholics and only Catholics into the country so we can form a Catholic? You know, and that that way we won't have um, you know drag queen story hour. And then I've talked about this on the other side. You got David French saying, "Oh, drag queen story tower hour is one of the great blessings of freedom." <laughs> you think like, well, these are all these big ideas, and guys love big ideas. Women frequently get up and say, yeah, I don't have big ideas, but I know you got to do this, 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 and this. Here's my list, you know? And it's like, it reminds me. It reminds me. Some people call me a, a, a sexist, and the reason they call me a sexist is because I'm a sexist. I believe that women and men are very different, and they think in different ways, and we have to have both sides of them in order to see the, the world whole. And I just remember this old New Yorker, New Yorker cartoon of a husband saying, well, I take care of the big things like world peace and my wife takes care of the little things like making sure there's food in the house and paying the rent. And so, and so Rachel Bovard made this speech and, you know, I, I was talking, I was talking to this guy, uh, John Fonte, who works at the Hudson Institute. And I was talking about this idea that did liberalism fail? And he said, well, if the, if the nation was wrongly founded, he's a very bright guy, he writes about immigration a lot. And he said, if America was wrongly founded, then we're done. We're finished, you know, and and that's right. And I don't think America was wrongly founded. I think our successes are proof that it was rightly founded and, and that this whole idea is wrong. And so we have to think about what it is we're doing here as conservatives instead of thinking, should we ditch the project and bring back kings and all this? And Rachel begins this speech basically by saying conservatism is not a program. It's a series of ideas. Here she is, is cut one. Conservatism, properly understood, is actually not a set of legislative goals, like lowering taxes, school choice, or even securing the border. It's a set of principles or goods, the things Russell Kirk called the permanent things, like family, opportunity, order, freedom, and faith. Conservatives enter the political arena with our eyes wide open, fully aware that these goods are often in tension with one another. And that's why different times and circumstances call for different prioritization of these goods. So conservatism in that mindset then is always young, always evolving. It's unchanging principles always supple enough to be reapplied to each new era and challenge. But people with eyes wide open must be able to see new challenges when they arise. And what, what she's talking about, she's talking about Reaganism. She's saying Reaganism served those goals in its time, but now it's a different time. And I think this is true. I think, for instance, cutting uh, taxes can be a dangerous thing when you haven't paid for the wars you've been fighting, when we're so deeply in debt. You know, you really have to come up with a way of cutting spending uh, before you can then cut the taxes. And, and these are things that Reagan, in some ways, failed to do because he wouldn't take on the welfare state. And she makes the point, a point I think that I've also talked about a little bit, that this wokeness whatever you want to call it, I call it like oppressive Maoist uh, stupidity, but wokeness for short, um, 
is, is a luxury item. It is something that you believe in when you're so rich that, that failed policies are not going to affect you. Right? One of the worst things about capitalism is it creates so much wealth that people start thinking socialism makes sense. You know, that they, they stop thinking about where the money came from. Uh, and, she, and she talks about the fact that we have to understand that when we're up against the woke, we are not up against the common man. We are not even up against the poor. We're up against the rich. And she's right about this in cut two. It's a totalitarian cult of billionaires and bureaucrats, of privilege perpetuated by bullying, empowered by the most sophisticated surveillance and communication technologies in history, and limited only by the scruples of people who arrest rape victims' fathers, declare math to be white supremacist, finance ethnic cleansing in Western China, and who all partied a mile high on Jeffrey Epstein's Lolita Express. Failure to appreciate the power and amorality and lack of principle of the woke elite should be seen as a disqualifying flaw in anyone that seeks to lead our communities, our institutions, and our country. Giving the elite any benefit of the doubt or waiting on the free market or a Republican judge to save us is indistinguishable from surrender. Sing it, sister. I mean, that really is, that is good stuff and it's smart stuff and it's practical stuff. This is what I really love about this speech. You can find the speech on the Federalist if you uh, uh, Google Rachel Bovard Federalist and go down her articles. Um, it is what we should do the next time we have power or something like that. Uh, and it's, re it's worth reading. I can only play a couple of clips from it. But th it's so practical. It is so practical that it's time we stopped being afraid. You know, I I can't stand it. I cannot stand it when I hear politicians on our side say, well, black lives matter. It's like you don't take some Maoist terrorist organization and say, yes, and, you know, black lives matter. Again, you know, you know that there's this wonderful C.S. Lewis novel called That Hideous Strength in which Satan tries to take over Britain and his organization is called Nice. You know, <laughs> it's, the same, it's the same thing. Black lives matter. Well, of course, that, you know, that's true, but that doesn't mean you're not a satanic Maoist terrorist organization. More on this in just a second, but first let's talk about my pillow. Again, I test my pillow every night by staying awake on it. You guys just sleep on it, but I know how comfortable it is because I'm awake all night. Now, MyPillow wants to give back to our listeners. You can get great discounts on all their products. If you go to MyPillow.com right now and click on the radio listeners specials, get deep discounts on MyPillow's mattress toppers, towels, so much more. For example, MyPillow is offering a buy one, get one free offer on Giza sheets, top quality sheets that you will love. Go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listeners specials for the buy one, get one free offer on the Giza sheets and use promo code DAILYWIRE at checkout or Call 1-800-651-1148. You will also get deep discounts on all MyPillow products, including pillow slippers. I love those slippers. The MyPillow mattress topper and MyPillow towel sets. That's MyPillow.com. Enter Daily Wire or call 1-800-651-1148 and tell them Daily Wire sent you. It's 1-800-651-1148. Then she goes on to talk about the... the policy we have to have toward big tech. And again, I know this is something else that I've hammered at, but right now, right now, just like in a fascist state, big tech is being used by government for governmental purposes. When I say government, I mean the left. I mean the deep state. I do not mean the people. Because obviously, you know, uh, uh, Rupert Murdoch said this the other day. He said, they're obviously censoring conservatives. This is the time when we are in a serious debate. We have to hear everybody's voice. And she really delivers here. This is uh, cut three. The first thing we do, we kill all the monopolies. <laughs> the big tech corporations in particular, not exclusive to them, but in particular, must be broken up, period, full stop. Now, spare me the platitudes about consumer choice or the pearl clutching about needing our own anti-American mega corporations to compete with China. Silicon Valley has had decades to prove themselves corporate patriots, and they are obviously content to be the opposite. Businesses like Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Apple exert state-like monopoly control over America's minds and markets, and they simply cannot be allowed to endure. The scale at which they exist is incompatible with a free society. In America, we integrate innovation into our values and traditions. 
We do not sit around and wait to be reformed in the image dictated to us by megacorporations. See, again, this is a kind of practical wisdom that sometimes we on the right lack. I, I sometimes feel that people on the right, I don't want to just say men, but men, sit around in rooms and come up with theories and then look at the world and the world has not, you know, that's what I talked about in the beginning, you know, Marxism makes sense. It's like, you know, what the, the right does this, for instance, when they talk about the, uh, what's it called, the success system or something like that, the success succession. But the idea is you graduate high school, you get married, you have kids, you get a job, you get married, you have kids in that order and you won't be poor. And I always say, yeah, that's that's fine. But if you're poor, you know, you might not have a father. If you're poor, your mother might be on drugs. Maybe you haven't got it together. You know, maybe the, the quickest way out of there is a gang. Uh, you have to talk about real people's lives in real situations. These mega corporations, these tech corporations, Facebook and Twitter and Google have never existed before. And just like the factories when they first came out had to be regulated to keep children from being abused and to keep people from having to work 50 hours a day, you know, putting a screw in a hole. They had to be regulated. They, they, we needed unions. Unions were a necessary evil. That's the thing. Unions are not a good. They're a necessary, but they are a necessary evil because of the abuses that people commit on each other. You have to have new responses to keep the American dream alive when new things come along. Just because Facebook or Google is a privately owned company does not mean it can't oppress you. And it is so big and it is oppressive and they are censoring people and it's got to stop. You know, there's this, uh, she was talking about China. There's an artist named Ai Weiwei, I think his name is pronounced. And he was on uh, PBS talking to Margaret Hoover. And he said, you know, in many ways, this is already a totalitarian state here in America. And this is a guy who stood up to the Chinese, so he's no coward. Let's hear it. If you are authoritarian, you have to have a system in supporting you. You cannot just be authoritarian by yourself. But uh, certainly in the United States, with today's uh, condition, you can easily have an authoritarian. In many ways, you're already in the authoritarian state. You just don't know it. How so? Many things happens today in U.S. is can be compared to cultural revolution in China. Like what? Like people trying to be unified in certain political correctness. That is very dangerous. Uh, he, uh, well, he's right there. And finally, I want to play one more clip of Rachel Bovard's speech at this National Conservatism uh, Conference because she gets at another thing that is the heart of the matter. And it is it is not something, it is not incidental, it is central. It is central to the conservative program, but it's central, more importantly, to the program of freedom. And that is the family is cut for. Domestically, national conservatives should focus on family and community formation as intensely as we ever focused on business and market formation. 40% of America's children today are born out of wedlock. 70% of black children. Everyone knows the intergenerational damage this does to families and to neighborhoods, to moms and their kids, and especially to young black men. And let's be very clear. The woke elite in this country do not care. Federal social policy is written almost exclusively by rich, white, progressive elites who attended the right schools, watched the right Netflix comedy specials, and parked their hybrid cars next to their Black Lives Matter signs. But their true values are expressed in the laws that intentionally punish young, low-income couples for, have, for having kids, getting married, and getting jobs. That is, for doing the things that would help them rise in America and maybe challenge the elite's privileged status one day. Be because the elites do get married, by the way. The elites do get married and do have children, do raise their children uh, in order to have generational wealth. And they do not want blacks doing that. And they, so they give prizes to Ta-Nehisi Coates and Ibram Kendi for telling them things that are going to stop them from doing the things that will make them succeed and compete. You know, I wasn't at this, I wasn't invited to this conference. I'm never invited to any conference. And the reason I wasn't invited to this conference is because of the things that I say, like when I call it a girl speech. But what she just said, and basically everything that she is saying and everything that I really believe, is why, is why, now that we are at this true crossroads, and it's a crossroad because one form, uh, one period of history, the post-war, post-World War II period of history has ended, and a new period of history with the internet has begun, and we haven't really kind of, 
you know, found our place, found our footing in order to impose our American values on that period of history. We haven't done that yet. We haven't figured out a way to do it. And that means that the corrupt, the evil, the wicked rise and they make their bid to take over the country. And that's what's happening. And there's no question about it. But this is why I feel that at this crossroads, women and specifically femininity are at the are the decisive powers. Uh, is the decisive power that is going to make all the difference. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. All right, in a second, we're going to talk about the apocalypse. But before the apocalypse comes, you want to live well, right? I mean, (laughs) why not? You want to be perfectly at ease and comfort and style. Hunter Douglas can help you do just that with their innovative window shade designs, gorgeous fabrics and control systems so advanced they can be scheduled to automatically adjust to their optimal position throughout the day. You know, I don't think about windows a lot, but when I fix my windows, when I get good uh, design around my windows, it makes me so much happier. Perhaps it's the way the shades diffuse harsh sunlight to cast a beautiful glow across the room or being able to enjoy the, enjoy the view outside the window while protecting your privacy inside. Maybe it's the superior insulation the shades provide, keeping you warmer in winter, cooler in summer, and lowering utility bills. It is a big deal to have nice windows. Visit HunterDouglas.com slash Clavin today to take advantage of the season of style rebate saving event. That's HunterDouglas.com slash Clavin for limited time savings. The offer expires December 6th, 2021. So last week I was talking about visions of the apocalypse, and I pointed out that while we have no idea, we have no idea when the end of the world will come, we have zero idea, but we do have a Christian belief of what it will look like, that there will in fact be two ends of the world, one for the saved and the other for those people we will politely call the salvation impaired. Uh, and, And I was saying that if you follow the trends of our current history, what it looks like, what it looks like is that one path that we're on leads to a mechanistic, materialistic, inhuman future where science becomes the science, like the Wizard of Oz, and promises that we're going to have power and happiness and eternal life, but really we all end up drugged in in a metaverse uh, that has no true love or friendship in it, uh, where the powerful make all the decisions for us, the knowledgeable, the experts make all the decisions, and we have no freedom on our own because, oh, the climate is going to destroy us if we don't do this, and the science says that, and you must follow the science. I mean, you could see it. You could see the trend in this uh, pandemic where people have to wear masks and hide in their room be afraid all the time while the science, the science, the Fauci's are going to tell us what to do. And that you can really see if you look far enough down that road, like about two miles down that road, uh, what the end of that uh, idea is going to look like and the kind of hellish world that could lead to. The Christian idea, I think, is is of a more human humanity. I talked about it being a kind of a a cycle that we uh, can return to childish innocence, not by going backward, but by going forward and becoming so knowledgeable, so wise that we become innocent again. Uh, And that means making choices, maybe making the choice to die instead of to live. I mean, making the choice not to become uh, some immortal head floating in a jar, but to live a natural life with a natural conclusion. Um, And I ended by saying that it seems to me that the dividing line is, is femininity, how we treat femininity and how women decide to regard their own femininity. Now, in order to talk about this, we have to have a definition of femininity because it can mean a lot of different things, and it's my show, so it's going to be my definition. And I want to make it clear at the outset that I'm not telling anybody how to live or what to do. Uh, Some of you who are more perceptive may have noticed I'm old. Uh, You know, they don't call me hot Gandalf for nothing. They call me that because I've been roaming around Middle Earth for almost 2,000 years. Uh, And I don't care what you do. (laughs) You know, I do not care what you do, how you live your life. I'm simply making observations about what I've seen in my 2,000 years. Now, first of all, femininity is obviously not the guise of femininity. It's not wearing dresses or lipstick. It's not sewing. It's not doing all the things that we associate with feminine femininity. I mean, some women don't act in a feminine way, and they are uh, feminine. I had a cousin when I was a kid. She was my favorite cousin, a woman named Belle. Uh, she was a battle axe. She used to, she was like a huge woman. She used to come into the house and go, where are the kids? 
Get me those kids. I'm going to hug them till they die. Come on, bring them. I love this woman, and she was a feminine woman. All she wanted to do was feed you and take care of you. And the hilarious thing about her is her husband was a tiny little man who was an absolute mouse, and he ruled their household. I mean, all he had to do was say, well, dear, I think what we should do is this, and she would do it. It would get done. She was all girl, but she didn't act in the way that we usually associate with femininity. Those things are exactly what the left says they are. Those things are social constructs that we use to remind us of inner an inner world. The left says, oh, they're attached to nothing. It's just a social construct. We just put it together. But no, they are there to uh, emphasize and remind us and play out and act out something that is internal in the same way that kneeling in prayer is there to act out uh, devotion. But femininity, in my definition, is the synchronization of a woman's internal spiritual state with the main purpose of her body, which is the creation and nurturance of human life. A man cannot be feminine because he doesn't have a body that does that. He can only be effeminate. He can change the look of his body. He can wear a dress and wear pearls like that Rachel Levine. It doesn't matter. He's not going to be, you know, Ben Shapiro can put on a cowboy hat. But he's not a cowboy. It's the same same principle that a man cannot be a, a feminine because he doesn't have the body to be in sync with. Part of it is this physical uh, act that defines a life, and it really it really does. You don't have to be feminine. You don't have to act in synchronization with your body. I'm just telling you my definition of femininity and the values of femininity look like something. It looks like something to produce, create, and nurture human life. It does not look like you know, expelling a life out of your body and then sending it off for Joe Biden's uh, minions to teach about gender and race race relations uh, with government paid daycare. It actually looks like taking care of children and feeding them. You know, you don't have to feed them out of your body, but still feeding them as if out of your body, being there for them, humanizing them, making sure they become human in the ways that are in keeping with your ideas of what humanity means. And all of that is sacrificial in some way. There's something sacrificial about femininity. There's something that says, I'm going to put people before things. I'm going to put other people before myself. I'm going to put uh, family and the inner world before uh, ambition in the outer world. doesn't mean eventually you can't reach those ambitions. I always think, why should women build their lives like men uh, who go out to make money first so they can get, basically so they can get married and have children? Uh, why shouldn't women have children first and then when they're done with that, go out and do the other things that people want to do? But it also means a, a spiritual understanding of physical actions. When moms wipe their kids' butts to change them. When moms put food on the table, that's not just dinner, that is love. That is love in operation. It is a spiritual act. And women who are feminine understand that instinctively, even if they don't uh, understand it philosophically, even if they're not thinking in those terms, they understand that what they are doing is an act of love. I've talked to so many. I remember a woman not that long ago who said to me, oh, now I have a child. My hands are going to be in crap all the time. I said, your hands are always and crap. They're just going to be in someone else's crap because that's an act of love. Homemakers and moms lay aside the values of power, the value of productivity, the value of wealth in order to do things for human beings that they have created and who have helped them in that creation. Now, feminine feminists destroyed the pride that women took in that. They're not the only things that destroyed it, but they're one of the things that destroyed it. Because all materialist philosophy hates femininity because femininity is not a materialist, is inherently not materialist. It says my actions are spiritual, my actions are, mean love, my, big, my making dinner means love, it doesn't just mean making dinner. It says that the, the uh, objects of this world are not my objects, my objects are the love of this child, the love of this husband, the, the making of a home. Materialists hate that. The socialists want you to be equal. The capitalists want you in the marketplace. They don't want you staying at home with the kids, and they want all want to disconnect sex from production. You know, think about how much you know. Science is has essentially been a masculine pursuit. Think of how much energy science and politics have been have poured into eliminating femininity, uh, feminism, birth control, abortion, uh, government daycare, transgenderism, all of these things are meant to eliminate femininity because it gets in the way of materialist progress. My daughter, Faith Moore, 
with whom I am, I, I'm proud to say I'm related. She wrote for the American Mind, uh, which is edited by my son, to, uh, with whom I have no relations whatsoever. Uh, but Faith Moore wrote a piece in the American Mind about how the uh, mecha- me- mechanical creation of life is going to destroy humanity, that you can overcome, you can solve the problems of humanity to a point where you have solved humanity itself. She says, for all of human history, women have had to grapple with the fact that their naked bodies are necessary for the survival of the species. Unlike men, whose role in production takes place in a moment, women spend nine months growing each new baby inside their bodies and many more months, sometimes years, feeding it from their bodies. In fact, this miracle of human reproduction, the harboring and sustaining of new life, is in essence what makes a woman a woman. It's what makes women special, sets us apart from men. She says, back in 2017, science uh, scientists successfully transferred an extremely premature lamb to an artificial uterus. She says, this is, you know, coming, it will eventually come to pass for people. And she says, for those who look for a world without sexes, this is incredible progress. In fact, it's the goal, because if the parts that make a woman a woman and a man a man no longer serve any functional purpose, it's much easier to argue that sex and gender are effectively moot. There's only one problem, our flesh has meaning. It isn't arbitrary or random or wrong. We aren't assigned a sex at birth. We are born into one. It is a function of who we become. We might be able to go to technological war against our bodies, but it's a war we cannot win. And this is why the symbol of the materialist future uh, is Dr. Frankenstein. I know I've talked about this before, but it's worth repeating. Uh, This is Mary Shelley, a teenage girl who had lost a baby, who was nursing a baby, uh, she hung out with these two men, Byron and Shelley, two of the great poets of their time, who were into free love. They believed in free love. Why shouldn't you? Why? Why should you uh, marry? And marriage is slavery. Uh, Shelley left his wife to run off with Mary, uh, and his wife ultimately killed herself, threw herself into the Serpentine in the in London, uh, and drowned herself um, because free love, of course is love without consequence. And women are carry within them the consequence for sex. And that's one of the reasons why it's, it's a problem that science can solve. And it will solve it. They have almost solved it with birth control and abortion. And soon they'll solve it uh, by having babies in a toaster uh, in your kitchen. And it'll, how much easier it'll be. And they'll laugh at their mothers. And they will have lost their femininity. They will have lost their humanity and lost their, uh, human. you know, they'll, they'll have lost their the, the essential fact of themselves. Mary Shelley envisioned this in Frankenstein. Now, the thing about Frankenstein, you know, there's, there's this horrible scene in Bride of Frankenstein where they play out uh, Mary Shelley with Byron and uh, Shelley. I've, I've played this before, but it has this, it's so corny, it's hilarious. Bride of Frankenstein, great movie, by the way, but this is the prologue and it's ridiculous. Let's just play a little bit of this. Can you believe that bland and lovely brow conceived of Frankenstein? A monster created from cadavers out of rifled graves? Isn't it astonishing? I don't know why you should think so. What do you expect? Such an audience needs something stronger than a pretty little love story. So why shouldn't I write of monsters? No wonder Murray's refused to publish the book. He says his reading public would be too shocked. It will be published, I think. Then, darling, you will have much to answer for. The publishers did not see that my purpose was to write a moral lesson. The punishment that befell a mortal man who dared to emulate God. You know, that's Mary Shelley herself actually, it's just a ridiculous scene, but Mary Shelley herself actually said that, that this was the story is about. It's not. It's not what the story is about because Frankenstein makes a human from body parts, which is what we all do. We all make humans from body parts. That's how we make new children. We make, the, only God can create things out of nothing. That what he what he does, his sin, and this is actually written into the novel, even if Mary Shelley didn't realize it, and maybe she did, maybe she didn't, what he does is he makes a human without a woman. And Mary Shelley invented science fiction writing this novel, and science fiction has always, always, I should say not always, but it has increasingly dealt with this horror of the human, of, of, of the female form and the female body. Uh, and we have seen in, for instance, Terminator, what does he do? What does the monster do, the Terminator do when he wants to stop a rebellion? He comes back to kill the mother, right? We saw the matrix, a, a word that comes from the same word as, as womb, which means the womb is made by two transgender guys uh, in which reality doesn't exist at all. And he's already invented uh, Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse, right? Now, I've talked about why feminism makes a certain amount of sense that uh, women's 
economic role has been undermined by science as, as well. Women used to be called the distaff because they made clothes, they made food, uh, they helped with the farm, and all those home industries were taken away when factories came in. And that's when feminism came up on, on the rise. And I'm kind of hoping that computers will bring home industries back because we see what happens when women are at home with their children. We see that these evil teachers, wicked teachers who are teaching children uh, ra- to be racist and are teaching children to be perverted sexually, uh, they get caught by mom. You know, mom comes home and suddenly says, hey, you know, you can't do this. And they say, well, we're not doing it. And it's like, I saw you because I was home. And we have to hope that women uh, regain their economic power that they had in the old days through more technology, which often solves old technology. If Frankenstein is the symbol of the hellish future, the future of the salvation impaired, the future of materialism in which science solves the problem of humanity by ending it, I would say that the Virgin Mary uh, is the symbol of the New Jerusalem, is the symbol of the future that I'm hoping for and the future that may only come after death uh, when a New Jerusalem comes forward. Uh, Mary is the one who uh, sacrifices, who said who was told by God that this thing is going to happen to her, that is could possibly ruin her life. She's going to get pregnant without a husband. She's going to get pregnant and her husband, her uh, fiance will find out about it. Uh, and she's going to have to explain it to him. It's not going to be easy. And she says, you know, here I am. I am the handmaid of the Lord. She makes that sacrifice. And she is a symbol of the fact that when God himself wants to be human, the first thing he does is he picks out a mother. And he picks out a mother because women are the gateway into humanity, not just in the Dave Chappelle sense between their legs, but also in the creation of humanity in their interchange with infants. This is a scientific fact. Wordsworth wrote about it in poetry, but we now know it also has a physical analog that there are... uh, Parts of the brain that only come online when they interchange with the mother and a child begins to become an individual and a human with mothers. Women are going to make this decision. Women are going to decide whether to play into their femininity, whether they can turn their backs on some of the wonderful things that you get by being out in the world, whether they can turn their backs on the values that have been pushed on them by the left, whether they are going to turn their backs on the materialism of capitalism and socialism and say, no, there is a third value, and that is the value of femininity, and all of our fates will be decided by them. An interview with Mark Hemingway coming up about Molly Hemingway and Mark's new book, Rigged, about the 2020 election. But first, you know how tired you get when you don't sleep? Well, just ask me. You get really, really tired and you do not want to be chugging caffeine all the time. Here's a new way to start your day with Super Beats Heart Chews. They're a tasty treat that give you the energy you need and are good for you. No more afternoon coffees, energy drinks, and candy for a quick pick-me-up. Add two delicious plant-based Super Beats Heart Chews to your morning routine and promote heart-healthy energy for your day without a caffeine crash because Super Beats Heart Chews' unique, clinically researched grape seed extract promote heart, healthy energy, and normal blood pressure as part of a healthy lifestyle. Do more for your heart and treat yourself with Super Beats Heart Chews. Join over a million customers. Get free shipping and returns, a 90-day money-back guarantee. And right now, you can get a free 30-day supply with your first purchase at superbeats.com slash Clavin, superbeats.com slash Clavin. You want it, but you need to know. How do you spell Clavin? It's K-L-A-V-A-N. There's no E's in Clavin. Just make it look this easy. All right, history is being made here at The Daily Wire as the first to file suit against the Biden administration for their unconstitutional vaccine mandates. We are pleased to see that the Biden administration suspended their implementation and enforcement this week. This is a huge win for the freedom of American workers to make their own medical decisions without the government's authoritarian hand getting involved. We cannot be happier to be at the forefront of this fight against Joe Biden's assault on our businesses, our bodies, and our private health decisions. However, there are plenty of businesses who are enforcing mandates, and our victory means nothing unless these businesses do the right thing and stop. It's understandable that there's been enormous pressure from the government to comply, but there's truly no reason now to force your employees to make a medical decision that they don't feel comfortable with. If you're an employee and your company is forcing this nonsense on you, there's no longer a reason for you to comply. They cannot force you to take a vaccine you don't want to. Do not let them hide behind the vaccine mandate. 
Unless we lose this case, none of us have to comply, and we won't. But the fight is just getting started. We still have to win the court case. Sign our petition against Biden's vaccine mandate over at dailywire.com slash do not comply to send a message to the Biden administration that Americans don't just do whatever you tell them to do. We've got over 600,000 people sign the petition, and the more signatures we get, the louder the message will be. That's why we're aiming to get to a million signatures. Head to dailywire.com slash do not comply to sign the petition today. Hey, I've already thanked you for buying when Christmas comes, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't buy it again or get your friends to buy it or buy it for your friends. It is, it's going to be the first on the list at the Wall Street Journal this weekend does their holiday books and their holiday mysteries. It is number one on the list. Dean Koontz has praised it. Brad Thor has praised it. As I told you, it's got a, a review in the Spectator saying it's fine literature as well as a great mystery story. Everyone who's read it really has just uh, been pouring wonderful reviews on Amazon. Please go out and buy it. It matters so much to me and that I can turn this into a series. And to see a book of this quality go up the Amazon list is really gratifying. Uh, and I think it's I actually think it's important because I think this is a really good book uh, written by one of us. And I hope you'll go and buy it when Christmas comes. So. We've been talking all day about corruption, and uh, one of, of course, the great examples of corruption was the full court press against Donald Trump, almost from the moment he was elected, really even before he took office and certainly culminating with the 2020 election. I know no one better to talk about than one of the better uh, journalists out there. Mark Hemingway is a senior writer at Real Clear Investigations. He's written for the Wall Street Journal, MTV.com. He's written for just about everybody who matters. Uh, he and his wife, Molly Hemingway, have produced a book called Rigged, which you won't be surprised to learn is about the 2020 elections. Mark, it's good to see you. How are you doing? Uh, it's great. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Um, that's the book. <laughs> yeah, there um, it is. Yeah. What, what's the subtitle? I don't have the subtitle in front of me. It's called Rigged. The subtitle is, I always have trouble remembering the things in order for whatever reason. It's how the media, big tech, and the Democrats seized our elections. Okay. Um, well, first of all, let, let's start with this. One of the most maddening things about the conversation about 2020 is that they, the Democrats or the left, the media, they're all one big blob. They act as if we invented the idea that elections can be questioned. Uh, yeah. that, nothing could be further from the truth, right? Yeah, we talk about it, that in the book. Uh, um, the Democratic Party hasn't unambiguously accepted the election of a Republican president since George H.W. Bush. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, both you know, in 2000 and 2004 and in 2016, there were all formal protests by like, you know, elected Democrats about the results of the election. And like, and people seem to have like forgotten this. You know, post 2004, you know, there was massive conspiratorial nonsense in the mainstream press about uh, Karl Rove's association with voting machine companies in Ohio and all this stuff. Um, you know, 2000, obviously, um, we just went through an election in, in Virginia where the gubernatorial candidate, Terry McAuliffe, um, still wouldn't say in, 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 in the year of our Lord 2020, 20, sorry, 2021, that uh, um, the that George W. Bush won the 2000 election fairly. Um, you know, this is an article of faith among Democrats that uh, um, you know the last several Republican presidents elected um, were elected unfairly, and it's it's absolutely insane. And the, but the weird thing about it was they they ricocheted from 2016, where we had massive Russian interference and Trump was an illegitimate president, saying that for years to 2020 in the middle of a pandemic where they increase mail-in balloting by, you know, tens of millions. The states are doing things like mailing out ballots to literally every single voter address on file. And then they're saying this was the most secure election in history. And how dare you question the results? <laughs> now, if you had to pick one thing, I mean, you listed when you were reading off the um, the subtitle of Rigged, you, were, you mentioned all these things. If you had to pick one thing that really made this election so insanely unfair because it really was it really was an unfair election no matter what you think of the vote count but before we even talk about that if you had to list one thing that really was unfair about this election what would it be yeah um well we talk extensively about this in the book although funnily enough since we published the book we're getting more and more information on this because conservative groups and republicans are finally really starting to dig into this but this thing happened where Mark Zuckerberg, uh, the CEO of Facebook, spent an excess of four hundred million dollars in grants that went to local election offices. So uh, Mark Zuckerberg has a foundation with his wife 
Um, it's called the Zuckerberg Chan Foundation. On the board of that foundation is David Plough, uh, Obama's former campaign manager, and one of the biggest like Democratic data guys out there. And what they did is they decided that they were going to give $400 million in grants to local election offices. Now, bear in mind, this is not a billionaire spending money for campaign donations and, you know, spending it on his preferred candidates. This was directly pumping money into your local nonpartisan election offices, i.e. the people that count the votes. And in this case, what they did is they took these two previously small um, um, foundations that were staffed basically by Democratic Party activists that were technically nonpartisan. One is called for the Center for Tech and Civic Life, and the other was called the CEIR. I forget what that stands for. But these two little foundations, and they, they gave them all this money, and they, they went around the country to states, and they said, look, we'll give you money um, for um, – to, for, to your local election offices. Ostensibly, this was for COVID relief stuff. Like this was supposed to pay for PPE for poll workers and things like that. In reality, what happened is, is they started dispatching these Democratic activists all over the country to work with local election offices. And there were all these strings attached to receiving this money from the Zuckerberg Chan Foundation. And pretty soon, these people with these foundations that were handpicked by Zuckerberg were doing things. They were designing ballots. They were translating ballots. They were determining where drop boxes were, were sent. Um, and, you know, of that $400 million, what we're learning now most dramatically is just how that money was targeted, essentially. So um, I th think the last statistic I saw was that 93 percent of the Zuckerberg grants went to counties where there was a majority of Democratic voters. Ah. Um, and on top of that, the money was heavily concentrated in a handful of swing states. Um, and we, even within the swing states, it was heavily concentrated in flooding the counties that were most pivotal with that with that money. So as a result, you end up with these weird disparities. So like Philadelphia got six dollars and fifty cents in Zuckerberg money for every voter in the in the area. The net the, 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 like an adjacent Republican county got something like fifty cents per voter in grant money. Um, you know, the state of Georgia um, got something like five times as much Zuckerberg money as neighboring Florida, even though Florida has twice the population of of uh, um, Georgia. And what happened in the election? Georgia moved five points away from Trump and Florida moved two points toward Trump. Mm. Um, you know, this was basically them running a Democratic get out the vote operation directly out of your local election offices. And the crazy thing about all this, it was all probably legal. I mean, like no yeah. one ever thought anyone would do anything this insane. But that's what happened. You know, and the scandal frequently of the election was what was legal. Yes, that that is what's amazing. I mean, consider... I can't believe, I mean, at this point, it's ridiculous not to believe it, but I can't believe how far south the media has gone, uh, which if you go back into the back in the day after Watergate was priding itself on how wonderful and how what a, how it spoke truth to power and all this, the silencing of the Hunter Biden story. Um, no. I was I was talking today about this woman, Heidi Plank, who's disappeared in L.A., who's connected to all, all of the people who are connected to Hunter Biden. And nobody's covering that story either. But this was an actual concerted attempt to keep Hunter Biden's corruption and Joe Biden's possible connection to it out of the press. Well, you know, look, I don't even know if it's like a possible connection, for instance. I mean, we know that Joe Biden met with Hunter Biden's corrupt Ukrainian business partners right. at Cafe Milano, this, you know, fancy restaurant in Georgetown. Like there are all these things out there. If the media were even remotely interested in this, you know, they, they I'm, I'm sure there was a lot to learn. You know, there were ways to verify the Hunter Biden laptop story. Uh, and people did um, long before the election took place. But instead, they tried to completely black out. Uh, the, the the story altogether. I mean, it was just you know absolutely fantastic, uh, the, the fantastical to imagine that we'd ever end up in this place in America. Um, Facebook spokesman, who by the way is a former employee of the Democratic Congressional Campaign employee and worked for Demo for Barbara Boxer, immediately announced that they weren't even go through the normal farce of a Facebook fact checking process, and they were immediately curbing the New York Post's the, the stories distribution on their platform. I mean, it was just absolutely outrageous. If anyone cares about you know holding power to account and, and you know freedom of information in this country, are, are these guys working? I mean, it it seems to me they've all banned Donald Trump. They all uh, suppressed the Hunter Biden story. Are they working in tandem? Are they on the phone with each other? They don't have to be. They're all just the same person. <laughs> You know, I, I really wish that there was some guy behind the curtain, you know, twirling his mustache and yeah. tying the damsel to the railroad tracks. Um, right. It would be, you know, that kind of corruption is a lot easier to root out. And, you know, we actually say this at one point, I think, explicitly in the book. You know, the, the reality is it's much harder to wrap your, your head around the fact that, 
you know, a lot of this happens simply because it is just sort of like hive mind. Um, you know, everybody has a specific goal. I mean, if you look at the media, for instance, and you look at what the media does and you just assume that the media's primary goal is to um, determine the outcome of the most important national elections in this country, um, all of a sudden everything the media does starts to make sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's just no way around that. Now, having said that, there was definitely some issues of some sort of suspicious coordination. You know, one of the things we talked about in the article, of course, and raised a lot of eyebrows was um, earlier this year, there was a story published by this um, journalist at Time Magazine named Molly Ball, um, where she talked literally about a, quote, well-funded cabal of, uh, um, you know, what was basically, that was those are the words she used, well-funded cabal. It was basically, you know, labor unions, CEOs, and uh, um, a bunch of Democratic activist groups all coming get together to, quote, unquote, fortify the election. That was the word she used and, quote, control the flow of information, basically. Um, and so there were all these like people and powerful forces that were actually on conference calls and things like that, that were doing things like, you know, reassuring the public with various, you know, planted news stories and press conferences and whatnot, that mail-in balloting is perfectly safe, even though for you know decades everyone has acknowledged the extent that we have mail-in ballots, they're far and away the most susceptible, you know, um, um, things to this far and away the most acceptable way of voting um, for, to fraud. So, um, you know, there were all these things there where they were just basically trying to sweep things under the rug and, you know, put their thumb on the scale for sure. You know, I, I was on a uh, panel once, a journalistic panel, panel at a high school, and the liberals kept saying, you know, kids, what you really have to do when you read a story is you have to go to the fact checkers. Now, you wrote a wonderful piece for the Daily Wire about fact checking. It, it's basically at this point, is it fair to call it a scam at this point? <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's worse than a scam. I mean, like, you know, I, the, 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 you know, I, I'd feel better if, if they were making money off of it. <laughs> um, you know, at least have some sort of like selfish motivation that I can understand. But the reality is, is that no, I mean, this, what they're doing is basically about power. So I've been writing about fact checking for you know a decade now. I mean, I wrote a cover story for the Weekly Standard back in the day called "Lies, Damned Lies, and Fact Checking." So it was like 2011, I think, um, about this, where I, I dismantled all this stuff about fact checking. I mean, like they've done university studies on this stuff. I mean, it's not rocket science. You know, PolitiFact and these other fact checking organizations will rate Republican claims as false at a rate of you know three to one over Democrats. I mean, like there's there's not even. There's not even a debate, really, empirically about whether or not they're harder on Republicans and Democrats. And then if you actually drill into the specific fact checks, it's absolutely outrageous. I mean, they take these things that are like true facts, but inconvenient for Democrats. And all you see at the top of the page, you see this big, bold letter, you know, picture of a Republican politician, a letter that says, you know, pants on fire in like, you know, 72 point type. Um, but then you actually like read their explanation for why this politician is lying. And it's all just contextual nonsense. It's petty fogging. It's kicking up dust. It's all these other things. You know, just an inconvenient fact for Democrats. And this has been going on for years. Right. It was already a, a, a farce. But what really happened in the last couple of years is that the fact checkers joined forces with big tech or rather big tech sought out them. Um, basically, what happened was in the wake of the 2016 election, you know, the entire liberal establishment in this country freaked out. If Donald Trump was elected, they immediately blamed two billions, two, two villains. The first was Russia. I mean, that's a whole rabbit hole we could go down to. And the second was Facebook. Donald Trump got elected in November of 2016. Uh, the employees at Facebook immediately revolted against this and said that, well, this was all a result of disinformation on our platform. And it, by the, Donald Trump's elected in November, by December of 2016, Facebook announced they have this fact checking program where they're going to partner with media organizations and the media organizations are going to do fact checks. And those fact checks are going to be used to censor, quote unquote, misinformation on Facebook. And that's as simple as it is. Donald Trump got elected. Facebook decided they were going to start censoring things. But the most outrageous thing is the press went along with this. They were mm -hmm. like, OK, we're going to allow Facebook to use us to launder their you know, misinformation concerns through us. And we're going to leverage our own credibility as media organizations to help Facebook censor this. And I know this because I worked at a publication that was participating in Facebook's fact checking program. I mean, it was just absolutely outrageous. We had you know, like a 24 year old fact checker, you know, who was entering, you know, links into the back of Facebook and Facebook, you know, based on the word of this 24 year old journalist, diligent that he was, was killing 80 percent of the global Internet traffic to that story that, that mm -hmm. like the one person decided was false. Wow. I mean, wow. this is absolute madness. Yeah. Yeah, and the corruption of the press and going along with it is is very dispiriting. Now, 
one of the things I felt about the aftermath of this election is that Donald Trump was not was not well served either by his mouthpieces or his mouth uh, in making a lot of <laughs> elaborate and extraordinary claims about, you know, Hugo Chavez coming back from the dead to rig uh, machines. Did you come away from this feeling that the final count was at least something like what it should have been? Um, so that's a really sort of tricky question. Okay. I mean, we can't sort of definitively answer these things. Um, um, you know, on, and when we no point in this book, do we ever use the word stolen or anything like that, mm-hmm. you know, um, just because I mean, part of the problem here is, you know, what you can and can't prove. Right. But that's the whole part of the gaslighting. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. the whole idea is to create a situation where, you know, you can't prove anything, you know, you have to like try and, you know, uh, prove things ex post facto. And, and, and it's, it's very complicated and murky. Like I said, it'd be a lot simpler if you could just, you know, go out there and see, you know, some guy's got a bunch of ballots in the back of the truck, but the, the methods for doing this stuff are much more sophisticated. Now, as for what you were saying about Trump not being well served by this, you know, we do talk about this. Um, you know, there, there was a particular case in Pennsylvania, for instance, um, what was going on in Pennsylvania was that there were a whole bunch of shenanigans that went on in Pennsylvania, but basically what happened was this, um, it was that, um, there were Democratic counties that were basically completely disregarding the state's election rules, right? Um, and they were choosing to do things like you, you weren't supposed to look at ballots before election day, but they were like looking at ballots you know, um, to see if there were problems with them and sending them back to voters to cure their ballots is the phrase that people use. So there's like a problem with a mail-in ballot that would normally disqualify it. They would send it back to the voter and say, hey, did you fix this, right? Um, they're not supposed to do that according to state law. So what happened was, is like Philadelphia and these Democratic places were disregarding the election laws and were, you know, tampering with the ballots before Election Day, whereas the Republican counties were not. They were adhering to the law. And so there was a lawsuit immediately afterward um, um, by a couple of sharp lawyers in Pennsylvania. Um, um, some, I think there were some Republican lawyers that parachuted them out of the state, but there was one particular lawyer that was from Philadelphia who was very well versed in these issues uh, over the disparate impact of this. Because what happens when one jurisdiction is abiding by a certain set of ballot rules and the other is not, you're watering down the, the impact of the votes in the other area, right? And this was a pretty clear cut case. The judge in the area seemed amenable to it. Um, it was proceeding along nicely. And then Rudy Giuliani parachutes in does this big bombastic thing and tries to turn this case that was not about actual electoral fraud, it was about disparate impact, into an electoral fraud case, and the whole thing just blew up, and the judge was like, get this out of my courtroom as fast as you can. Hmm. And uh, the, the 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 poor Republican lawyers that were actually doing yeoman's work basically were you know trying to wash their hands of it as fast as they could, and it just, it all blew up. But it was a chance to actually prove that some shenanigans were going on, and uh, we never got to that point, unfortunately. Did- did you look at, I mean, some of the things that went on Facebook, uh, on Twitter, uh, like the guys who pulled out a bin of votes, uh, you know, from underneath the table, uh, struck me as the sort of thing that looks worse than it is. Am I wrong about that? I mean, there, there seemed a lot of rumors that went around that were not sustainable. No. <laughs> yeah. Actually, um, you, I, I would say it's particularly with the stuff that went down in Georgia with the suitcases full of ballots and things like that. It was actually, it was actually worse than the media wanted you to believe. Okay. Um, Basically, what happened was there was a bunch of contemporaneous reports that came down that night and that said they were going to stop counting for the night. All right. Like, who does this? It's an election <laughs> night. It's, right. it's presidential election. Right. And so the Republican election observers and the press and everybody packed up and went home. There's like you know, dozens of contemporaneous reports that this happened. And then shortly afterward, they started counting ballots again. Mm. OK. No one has fully explained what the heck was going on there, why they did this. Um, you know, of course, this was also an incident where another media fact-checking organization parachuted in to say, oh, no, all is calm. There's no reason to be worried here. Never mind that the fact-check was, you know, dubious um, to begin with. And so there was all this gaslighting of this stuff. And, like, but, you know, again, do I do I know exactly what happened then? No, but I do know that some serious shenanigan went down where they told everyone to go home, and then they started counting ballots again. I mean, mm. like, it, how do you explain this? I mean, you know, how do you not, you know, sound claxons over that? I mean, it's crazy. But, you know, again, there were just all these things like that that just totally undermine people's confidence in the system. And they, you know, tended to happen in one particular direction, um, you know, in very heavily Democratic jurisdictions and urban districts. I mean, and it's, you know, it's not a mystery that, you know, all of these things tend to go in one direction uh, at some point. And very quickly, because I'm out of time, is there, do you think this can get better? I do. 
Um, for a couple of reasons. One is just, you know, having gone through the shock of all this, I think that the Republicans are going to be much more savvy about this. One of the interesting things that came up in the book, and I didn't, I was shocked. Somebody's been reporting politics in DC for 20 years. I did not know this. The Republican National Committee, like not a small organization, mind you, had been barred from doing election day organizing activities for uh, about 30 years. Basically, what happened was there was some, you know, New Jersey election that went sideways and a federal judge ruled against the Republican Party and put them under this consent decree that, you know, forbid them from doing anything. That judge retired. And even after he kept senior status as a judge, he kept this decree from getting Republicans, um, you know, active in election day, like federal, this federal decree, keeping them from doing it. In effect, it took the judge dying. Uh, um, I mean, it was so 2020 was the first election in like 30 years. The Republican National Committee was actually involved in like election day organizing activities. Plus, on top of that, all the lawsuits and the shenanigans and the mail-in balloting stuff ramping up so quickly. It took, you know, they caught Republican un Republicans unaware, but I think that they're aware of these issues and the muscle memory and, like, the legal teams and things. I'm Don't get me wrong, they're still going to be at a disadvantage compared to the institutional benefits that Democrats have from partnerships with law firms and stuff, but I think they're going to get on top of it better for the next election. That's good to hear. The book is called Rigged, How the Media, Big Tech, and the Democrats Seized Our Elections. Uh, it's by Molly Hemingway, but I happen to know that Mark Hemingway uh, was, was a co-author on the book. And Mark, I really appreciate your coming on. Uh, it's great talking to you. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's an honor. And thanks for having me on. All right. It is that time again. I know you've been dreading it. You love your problems. You've got them gathered around you like children, but it's time to bid them farewell because we're about to solve them all in the mailbag. He said some bad words. He said the N-word. Yeah! <laughs> I don't even know what that was. Does it matter? No. Uh, all right. From Jenny, I'm a young wife, soon to be mother. I'm really struggling with my faith. Uh, I grew up in a nominal Christian family, and now I'm not even sure what is true. I'm confused on whether God is good, whether he is truly Jesus, how to be accepted by Jesus if he is, and whether I'm strong enough to be a Christian anyway. I wonder if I'm strong enough to follow the king. This is causing deep psychological pain. I'm extremely depressed and live in constant anxiety at the thought of hell and God himself. I have a husband, a daughter on the way. I wonder how I will be a good mother to the sweet girl with these struggles. Any advice would be extremely appreciated. Also, if you know of any authors that do a good job of showing God is good, I would appreciate it. Thank you, Clavin. Um, I'm going to take a, a flyer on this. I can't, um, you know, I, I can't read your mind, but I, I, this actually doesn't sound like a theological problem. This sounds like a psychological problem. I, I don't think, I, I'm, I do not think that you are depressed because you are struggling with your faith. I think you're struggling with your faith because you're depressed. And that happens a lot, uh, not a lot, but it is not uncommon uh, in pregnant women. It is, uh, it is something that uh, you have to deal with, um, with medical care and with someone to talk to. I think you should go to your uh, OB, what do they call them, your, uh, your gynecologist and, um, and, and talk to her about it and tell her or, or him and, and tell him how you feel and, and see if maybe uh, there's a therapist who can help you with this. Uh, you know, that you, there are plenty of books you can read. You can read Mere Christianity on, is a very good book about God and his goodness and what Christianity means. But I, I'm just not convinced that that's really the problem, that suddenly you have this philosophical difficulty with God. I think that maybe you're struggling with something uh, uh, that about pregnancy, it might even be hormonal, and, and maybe you should deal with the depression and see if the God part of it, the theology part of it, works itself out. It doesn't really matter uh, how you feel about God, because God remains the same whether you feel, you know, people think that God is dependent on their belief. <laughs> it's not the way it works. He's there whether you have faith in him or not. He's good whether you believe he's good or not. Uh, he is who he is, no matter what you think. So it, that that's really not the issue you're dealing with. I think maybe it, it, just, it sounds to me like you are you have psychological pain, and the psychological pain is causing the feel is is expressing itself in a theological problem. Uh, try that. Try going to your doctor, uh, discussing with him or her uh, the, your feelings in an honest way. Uh, see if there is some kind of therapy that maybe uh, a a pregnant woman uh, can avail herself of that you can avail yourself of that will deal with that specifically before you f f try to figure out uh, the king of the universe. Um, but again, you know, C.S. Lewis is a wonderful writer about these issues. 
All right. The next one is from Anonymous. Uh, hello, Mr. Clavin. I am your, quote, weird Uncle Fred, who for some strange reason has never gotten married. He's quoting me. He says that's from last week's show. That is to say, I am gay. I'm 25. I don't date at this time and never have, but I would like to. I'm not out to any of my family and only one of my very closest friends. Uh, I strive to be an honest person. Uh, and it bothers me constantly that a massive part of who I am, I'm hiding from family and friends. Um, I, I feel like I'm lying to the people I love and it makes me feel like a hypocrite. If I tell them it will crush my dad and my mom and uncles won't take it well either. They are all very religious. And so am I, by the way, I've made peace with my faith and sexuality. They, however, will not see it this way. What's your advice? Should I come out or keep hiding it? Uh, thanks so much for considering my question. I look forward to your life changing answer. Well, uh, this is a question that I think you've already answered that you have to uh, come out. I think, um, you know, being a, uh, gay man does not absolve you of being a man. And one of the first obligations of a man is to be who you seem to be. That doesn't mean you don't have a private life. It doesn't mean you don't have things that you don't want to share with people, but it does mean that you're not a phony, that basically people can trust your word and they can trust you to present yourself in some sense as you really are. And I think that's very important with your family. Now, this is going to be incredibly difficult and it may be incredibly painful. Um, your, your family is religious and my son has struggled with this. He's a deeply, my son is a deeply religious person, a deeply Christian person and a gay person. And has, I'm going to have him on the show uh, soon to really talk about that and how he has solved that problem and, and worked that out, worked out his theology. Uh, I want to talk to him about that on air because I think it's really important. People write to me every time I mention him and say that he's a deeply religious person. People write to me, no, he's not, you know, it's like, because they don't know what they're talking about. Um, and and I, I believe that, I believe you when you say you're religious and I believe that you're, you have thought about your faith and thought about what you should be doing in terms of your faith. Uh, and it's entirely your decision, something that you have to decide uh, in keeping with your relationship with God. You, you have made that decision. I can tell from reading your letter that you have made that decision and now you have to go to your parents. Now, I don't know how your parents are going to react. And I know, I have seen with my own eyes the incredible pain uh, of people who have been rejected by their parents for being who they can't help but be. And, uh, and I know it is a, a, just a terrible burden to bear, and I can't promise you that you're not going to have to bear it. Um, you know, when God puts us in these situations, I believe that he has a reason for it. I believe he is showing you a way uh, that you're going to have to move forward, and it may be, it may be that your uh, parents come to terms with this. They, they love you, I'm sure. Uh, they, they may be shocked, but they may come to terms with it and come back to you, or they may not. And I certainly know a lot of gay people who've been reacted, re rejected by their parents. And I, I, it's a terrible, terrible thing to think about, to have your parents just say, uh, we will not be your parents anymore, or we will not act like your parents anymore because of who you are. So you're, you're facing something genuinely difficult and genuinely, um, uh, that could be genuinely painful, and I don't, I don't want to lie to you about that. But I also think that this is these are this is the toll of being a man. We most men, if they are men, have lost something uh, because they had to be themselves in the moment of crisis. Uh, moments of crisis. Some of us get to avoid a lot of moments of crisis, but they're almost always there. Eventually, this is yours, and uh, I think in order to be a man, you're going to have to talk to your parents. Uh, you know. And I, and I hope it works out for you. I do. But I think that you have already made the decisions that have to be made in terms of who you are and who you are with God and how you are with God. And those are not um, anyone else's decisions but yours to make, and they're not mine to make. And so now you have to deal with this decision, which I think is written for you already. Uh, you cannot be a full human being and live in secrecy. It just can't. And the toll that this has taken on gay people uh, through the ages is, has been visible. I've lived through it that time and seen it in people. And it's, uh, you know, it's just damaging. It's damaging to live like that. It's, da it's like people, it's like right-wingers in Hollywood who hide who they are. Uh, I've seen the price that they pay. I see it in their eyes. You know, I see it in the way they talk and make excuses. And again, there is that 
there, that pathway of corruption that if you don't accept and say, you know, I'm going to say what I have to say, I'm going to tell the truth, I'm going to work toward the truth, even if it means experiencing pain, even if it means experiencing sacrifice, even if it means experiencing shame. If you don't do that, you just go down the road uh, deeper and deeper into darkness. Um, it's painful advice. Uh, I'll do a quick one uh, from Adam. Dear Mr. Too Good for Hollywood in a literal sense, Clavin. Uh, over the past several Christmases, our family has developed a tradition, uh, a tradition of finding and watching a different film version of A Christmas Carol, one of the all-time greatest ghost stories. Its powerful messages of eternal consequences, redemption, and hope have always touched me. Um, as someone who has extensive experience in storytelling and adapting the written word to the big screen, do you have a favorite version of the story? Is there a definitive film version of A Christmas Carol? He says, on a personal note, my money is on the Alistair Sim Scrooge, though Patrick Stewart's version does a good job as well. Uh, it is, you were correct the first time, it is the Alistair Sim Scrooge. There is no better film than that. It is actually one of the great movies uh, of all time, and it's great because Alistair Sim plays Scrooge as if he believes himself to be right. He doesn't play him as mean. He pl plays him as justified. And that is what Scrooge would be like in real life. That is what mean and wrong people are like in real life. They are absolutely convinced uh, that they are correct. And that's the way he plays them. And that's what makes the, the film so powerful. It's also beautifully written and scored and acted. It's perfectly cast. Uh, I got to stop there. Uh, I won't be here for Thanksgiving, but we will put together a best of collection for you. And I hope you will be there for that. But mostly, I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Remember, there is no giving thanks without someone to give thanks to. Give it to him. He's earned it. Have a wonderful holiday. And I will see you after two amazingly clavenless weeks. Just buy my book. Buy When Christmas Comes, and that'll tide you over until we are back with The Andrew Claven Show. I'm Andrew Claven. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Lisa Bacon, supervising producer, Mathis Glover, executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our technical director is Austin Stevens, production manager, Pavel Widowski, editor and associate producer, Danny D'Amico, lead audio mixer, Mike Cormina, animations are by Cynthia Angulo, hair and makeup, Cherokee Hart, production coordinator, McKenna Waters, and our production assistant is Jacob Falash. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production, copyright Daily Wire 2021. Today on the Ben Shapiro Show, the groundswell begins for an AOC presidential run. Democrats in the House make yet another push for Build Back Better. And the judge in the Rittenhouse case bars MSNBC from the premises. That's today on the Ben Shapiro Show. Give it a listen. Listen.